Yes, sir. You are live now. You can start. Yeah. Good morning, participants. Welcome to the third live session of Supply Chain Digitization Course. So I'm sure you are preparing for the exams. Yes. So please uh, put your questions in the chat box. So some sir, IRG has some questions. This is related to the NPTEL team. Uh, like if someone can answer, like how many hours the exam would be, and related to exams only. So Sangam sir, the NPTEL team will answer that question. So then I was going through the questions raised by the participants who are responsive that is the excel file so during exam how can we use excel server for solving the problems so this is by mr siva kumar so you don't have to use excel server because uh, the questions will not require you to use excel server okay So I hope it clarifies your doubt. So there is no need of using Excel solver during the exam. However, you need to use it for practicing the problems. Then again, next question is by Josna George. How are these questions asked from the portion of Python? So again, Again, you don't have to use Python uh, for the exam, but for the practice purpose, and if you want to be comfortable and confident using supply chain digitization, you have to use Python. So for the final exam, there is no question which require your Python uh, interface, but I would strongly urge all of you to use Python to practice Excel Solver, to practice Python uh, coding. So that is how you will gain confidence in long run. And that is one of the purpose of the supply chain digitization course. So we are not only teaching theory, we are also focusing that the students should be able to uh, solve the problems by coding in Python as well as Excel Solver. So that is strong encouragement from our side that we use it. Although in the exam, as uh, we will not ask any question in which you require python interface or excel solver is this right correct okay yeah then there's a question by vijay uh, vijay simha tangela so she is asking about the exam pattern and important topics. All the topics are important. <laughs> so you have to study all the topic, topics starting from the beginning till the end. So all topics are important. Okay. And exam pattern, NPTEL team will answer. Okay. So we have NPTEL team. They are answering your queries in the chat box. Please go through the chat box. Like as Omkar suggested from NPTEL team, no negative marking. Okay. So there will not be any negative markings. It will be three hours exam. <coughs> okay, so this right now there is no specific question, mostly related to the exam. I know because exams are approaching, so you will have doubts. Then, um, okay, there are some questions in the Excel file which you have received. Uh, you must have submitted using Google Sheet. So we are going through that.
Okay, then there is some question from Ramani. Uh, she is asking, I would like to discuss more on sessions for supply chain professionals working in my company, part of internal people development program, and also whether I can contribute for a project or paper publishing. So sure, you can uh, separately write email to me or one of the faculty coordinator, uh, Professor Priyanka Barma, Professor Sushmita Narayana. If you have specific requirement, please uh, write an email to us and then we'll uh, take it forward. Okay, so this there is a question related to network optimization and using logistic software uh, by Mr. Uh, yeah, Parimal Darbar. Okay, so I am opening the any logistics software. Okay, some of Mr. Jagan asking, refer any books which are only objective question. Okay, so there are many books uh, on supply chain management, but there is no specific book which covered all the topics which we had discussed in the class. So therefore, you may have to find multiple books to get these topics. And there are some topics which may not be there in the books also because these are very advanced. So we have taken reference from research papers. Again, there is no need of Excel solver, okay? So till now, mostly related to exam, uh, but one question is related to network optimization. So I am going to open the slide. If you have any specific questions related to the topic, please post it over here because uh, other questions can be answered by the FPTL team through email. Uh, okay. Lecture 54. So there is a question from lecture 54. Uh, Parimal Darbar, if you are in, if you are online, can you please mention which slide it is? Parimal Darbar, you have written in the response sheet which we had shared with you. But I am not sure which slide you are referring. If you give the slide number, that would be very much useful. So Aditya, this live session is basically for doubt clearing. If you have any doubt related to the topics, you can mention, okay? So Vijay Simha, yes, so you are more interested in procurement and strategic sourcing. Uh, I am Mumbai being uh, one of the leading institute in logistics and supply chain management. We run a lot of programs, uh, short term as well as long term. So please have a look at our website and I am sure you will get some program which would be of your interest. So you can directly go to imumbai.ac.in and then I can refer the website okay so time to time we announce and there are a lot of courses uh, we do a lot of training programs for industry practitioners we do a lot of training programs uh, specifically curated for a 
a specific industry. So if you are having any specific requirement which you think that uh, would enhance your skill and require our um, guidance as well as expertise, please write to us. I uh, would be helping you. However, if you want a general course, then any time you can refer to our website and there are many programs, short term as well as long terms are running, you can enroll. Parimal Darbar, I already mentioned it's lecture number 54, but which, uh, which slide, slide number? Slide number I have not mentioned. Can you please mention that too also, that would be useful. Okay, Professor Susmita also has joined. Yes. So, Susmita, there is one question related to IoT by Sivan Sukla. No? Yes. <clears throat> Hello, everyone. Welcome to this uh, live session. Uh, in this session, we are you know clarifying any doubts you have with any of the topics that were uh, taught during the course. Um, and, uh, you know, we are also trying to understand if there were any, um, you know, uh, suggestions or some kind of insights you would also like to share. This is a good time to do that. Uh, so, let me look at this question by Shivang Shukla. Uh, can you explain more about IOD? So, I will put it in a very simple way so that you can understand. Uh, the idea of uh, IOT is to get uh, data and create actions in real time okay so now why is this important in supply chain management suppose we are talking about uh, you know materials that are being stored in cold storage let's say you're talking about perishable products like uh, agricultural products uh, which you know uh, require certain kind of levels of temperature humidity to be maintained so they are usually maintained in cold storage now, if this is being maintained in my facility, then I will check it daily as to what the temperature is, what the humidity is. I will check the freshness of the uh, materials and I will be able to take a call as to uh, when uh, I should change the temperature and when I should uh, maybe look at uh, uh, bringing in new materials also. But what happens is sometimes uh, you might not be able to access your facility very easily. Or a better use case would be that the materials are actually in transport. So cold storage in transport. Now in such cases what is going to happen? For long distances your products are going to be traveling without much of an intervention other than the person who is driving the vehicle. And that person might not necessarily be very trained in understanding what should be the temperature regulation that should be maintained for the items there. So what we can have is some kind of way of controlling and monitoring monitoring and controlling the uh, environmental conditions for the products from some other location uh, elsewhere, right? So in such cases, IoT is very helpful. In the sense, you will have uh, wireless sensors which will be embedded within the uh, you know vehicle maybe where the materials are stored they will be measuring the temperature conditions humidity conditions and there will also be an air conditioning system which is going to be provided in real time they will be relaying this information to a control station through internet so that is why we have internet of things which we are talking about because this is going via wi-fi over internet this is going to be relayed or transmitted to uh, some kind of a platform so on this platform, you are getting the information. So this is a part of monitoring. You are getting information in real time. But the second step which I said is control. So in control, from this platform, some kind of decision has to be sent and relayed to the air conditioning system. right? So which means again you will be using the internet in order to relay this information to the sensors and then 
the um, air conditioning system will be regulated. So there is a two-way interaction which is happening and this is possible because you have sensors, because you have an uh, internet technology being used and because you have a platform where monitoring and control is possible. So this is a very simple use case I am uh, explaining to you about IoT. And uh, this is used uh, not just in temperature monitoring, but in many other cases also it can be applied. Uh, let us say we are talking about a manufacturing facility. We want to be having, uh, you know, almost no human interventions occurring in the process. It could be very sensitive processes or very uh, hazardous processes where you don't require human intervention. We can have sensor-based te uh, technologies which are working to relay the information and also to control based upon commands that are sent through a platform. Uh, so we call it Internet of Things because various devices are actually talking to each other with the use of Internet in order to carry out monitoring and control. So this is the very simple idea of IoT and as you can understand, it has a very huge application in supply chain management, but, uh, particularly because we are getting into global supply chains. So we should be able to, you know, have a lot of uh, transparency as well as real-time visibility of data when we are moving goods from one place to another, assembling goods uh, at different locations and supplying them to different markets which are globally dispersed. So here this kind of technology is coming into place in a very strong manner. Uh, so I hope that answers your query, Shivang. I think we can move to other questions also. So we are having many questions related to the exam and I think that is also being uh, answered by the NPTEL team. Yes, Shivang has responded. Thank you, Shivang, for staying staying back to uh, listen to the response also. Yeah. So, Ramani Paneer Selvam has asked, please guide us on topic or problem selection so as to apply these taught concepts for project purpose. I think this both of us can answer, uh, Professor Devabratta. Uh, would you like to... Uh, you know, maybe add a few points and then I'll also add to that. Yeah, you can start now. You can start fast. <laughs> then add. Right, right. So, uh, you know, it's a very interesting question you're asking, Ramani. It's a very practical uh, question that you're asking. Uh, because what topics we have learned in the course, you should also be having some kind of application uh, potential. Um, see, it depends upon uh, whether your query is uh, related to practice or research. So I will first take it up from a practitioner perspective uh, if you are working on different kinds of projects. So the first uh, and foremost question is to identify if there is any problem as such. Let us say you are talking about supply chain issues. Some of the problems that can be indicated in supply chains would be that there are consistent delays that are happening from your supply side. These are all what we call as symptoms. There are some symptoms of a problem that are going to occur. So if there are consistent delays occurring from your supply side, maybe your vendor is actually not reliable or is going to get bankrupt soon or is having their own challenges. So the symptoms would be there are consistent delays. And how will you figure out there are consistent delays? In the back end, you will always be analyzing the data with respect to the time of deliveries of the products from the supply. So, what you have is essentially a huge amount of data that you need to be mining in order to indicate when problems are going to arise in the system. So, with this, suppose you have identified there is a problem, <clears throat> then you will understand that it is related to a procurement problem and which means you might need to relook at your procurement strategy, right? So, from here you have got an indication. So you will go into some of the topics that we have explained with respect to maybe supply portfolio creation, vendor selection, or maybe the application of data and development analysis uh, to check whether the suppliers are being efficient or inefficient with respect to the proposed outcomes. Okay. 
So you have looked at some simple symptoms in order to identify what could be the next steps to be carried out. But more importantly, you should also be looking at what is the financial impact of the symptoms that you have observed. So even if there are delays which are occurring in your uh, supply side, what is going to be the impact upon your bottom line? Let us say the cost of goods sold. Right? You are procuring the items. How does it impact that? How does it impact your inventory costs? Right? How does it impact your onward transportation? How does it impact the final value of the goods sold to the customer? So you have to measure the financial impact of uh, this particular concern that you are seeing. So which means what? You are looking at operational aspects, which is supply side concerns related to time. And then you are looking at financial impact, which means you will be looking at your uh, accounts. You will be looking at account statement related to it. You will be tracking your expenses. Uh, you will be checking your invoices that have been paid or unpaid. So huge amount of data analysis is also carried out in order to understand what is the financial impact of the problems that you are observing. This will actually indicate to you the severity of the problem. So you have seen the problem, but you also need to understand what is the severity of the problem. So if the delays are very large, but it is not having a huge impact upon your profitability, then the delay is large, but it is not severe enough to impact profitability. So you get that linkage over there. And that will tell you whether you should really address this problem as a priority or whether you should start some kind of a continuous improvement project which needs to be carried out. Right? So this is an example in which what we are doing is we are actually continuously, I think one of the objectives of our course was also to share with all of you that we have to continuously analyze data and derive insights in order to create any kind of assessment of problems uh, and we also need to be aware of the kinds of tools to be applied in order to solve these problems. So that is where the analytics aspect related to tool development comes in. Suppose you figured out that your supply side concern is because of poor network design. That means you need to relook how you can create the network design. So then you will go into understanding how you can apply simple optimization tools in order to create a proper network design. And you can change, let's say, the location of the facilities that you're having or the location of uh, maybe the supplier that your uh, supply side location only you might want to change. So these decisions can then be taken up. The idea over here from this very course is to show to you that you need data driven decision making to be carried out when it comes to supply chain management. So I hope uh, that gives a little bit of insight to you Ramani and I will actually ask Professor Devarvata to add to this if anything has been missed out. Yeah, no, thanks Professor Susmita, very nicely you summarized uh, most of the like content of the course and how it can be connected with the real life problems. So if you are working in the industry, Ramani, uh, so then there are various ways na, to start a project. So some of the project comes uh, from outside the organization, okay, which you may not have thought of, uh, but the industry requires you to put resources and develop skills in that area because you have to compete with the competitors. Some project requirements comes within. You find out where are you lacking and then in that domain you start your projects. So these are the two ways usually a project starts. So now if you see our syllabus, so we have started with the basics of supply chain and then slowly, slowly we discussed the role of digital business in supply chain because today's area, uh, today's uh, arena or today's time is mostly about big data analytics because it's easy to store data, easy to capture data and it's very easy now because of the cloud facilities to do cloud computing, analyze large scale of data, uh, specifically image data as well as the video data, which 15-20 years back was very difficult. Let us talk about text data also. So text, video, audio and image data. So these are the few data points uh, which were very difficult to store uh, because of, of course, the limitation of storage facility. As well as uh, there was no technology to analyze those. But if you uh, look into our syllabus, we have discussed there are various uh, 
OS to analyze image data. I will give two examples, uh, one of image analytics, another of video analytics, which organizations are doing across the industry. So there are large, let us take an example of a big warehouse, okay, 1 lakh square feet, 2 lakh square feet of warehouse. And you have to find out whether the inventory which is there in ERP is matching with the physical inventory. That is basically inventory count. So people are spending a lot of money, uh, resources to do physical count. Uh, but is there any technology? Can I use supply chain digitization tool to solve it? Yes. So there are few companies in European Union uh, who are using this. So they have, uh, what they have done in one of the large organizations, so they have used drone and on top of the drone, they have fitted uh, video camera, okay. So they are, what they do, because in the night, the whole warehouse is actually closed. It's unlike India, in Europe, mostly in the night time, no operations happen, so the warehouse is closed. This drone, goes each and every aisle and scan each and every product and by morning it comes back with a report. So what happens which uh, earlier you were doing physical verification, you used to spend time, resources, uh, so this has become automated. So now that particular company is able to match physical inventory versus the digital uh, versus the inventory which is there actually in the ERP. So the discrepancy inventory is reduced and because of that uh, the loss which we are making earlier it has been prevented. Then there are examples of image analytics uh, which people are doing specifically in the industry of semiconductor industry. Imagine the size of the chip is very small. If I have to do quality check by myself manually it's very labor consuming like to take time, plus I may not be able to find out, so even with the magnifier glass, uh, people may mis make mistakes. So therefore, a lot of image analytics techniques are being used in the Taiwan uh, manufacturing facilities. So they are actually doing this, so they have image of good quality, best quality uh, chip, and that image is being uh, kept as a model image, and then all the other chips which are being manufactured in the factory are passing through a Missing. So then if there is a discrepancy in the circuit, automatically the tech, uh, the tool will point out that there is a discrepancy in the circuit. Not only the discrepancy, it will also pinpoint that is the location where there is a mistake in the circuit. So what you are doing at one go, you are not only reducing your resources, manpower you just, you know, you are also increasing the efficiency of the factory, you are increasing the, uh, you are reducing the quality effects. So these are few examples, there are many uh, such examples, only thing you have to keep an eye open and see what is happening around the world. So therefore, uh, please read a lot of good magazines and research papers, advanced research papers in your domain, uh, then you will get an idea where should you go. And you should not think only today, you have to think 10 years down the line, uh, that is how the project ideas will come because project will take time to implement. So to start now, maybe after three, four years it will be implemented. So you have to think ten years ahead. So these are few examples. Uh, I hope you got some idea. Okay, so thank you. Okay. Then there are a few questions related to any logistic uh, by it she has asked long time back. Parimal, Parimal has asked long time back. So I will share my screen. So this was our problem, like we need to decide, I have two factories, one in Aurangabad, another one in Nasik, these are probable location of the factory. I have not yet decided which location should I locate. I have two probable location of distribution center, one is Vivandi, another one is Bapi, and these are the four customers. 
so i know the customers demand uh, i'll go back to one more slide So I know uh, the demand of the customers, yearly demand at each of these location. I know their exact latitude and longitude. So I know where these customers are located, and I also know their yearly estimated demand. So I have to find out which uh, location should I locate my factory, which location should I locate my DC. So I have many options. I can have only one factory. At Ongar Orangabad, I can have only one factory at Nasik. I can open two factories at both the places. Similarly, I can have two DC. I can have only one DC at Ibandi, one DC at Bapi. So first, I have to decide where should I locate my factory, where should I locate my DC. Once that decision is done, then which factory will be sending products to which DC, and from which DC, how many units of products will be transported to these customers. So this is basically the network optimization model. So we have explained the mathematics behind it in the class. So now, this is the solid problem. So I have two factories. This is the possible location of the factories. This is the possible location of the DC. And these are my four customers. Okay. So this is not an optimum solution. This is possible location. So that is how the connection is there. Now, once I solve this model by using these parameters. So I know the actual location of these two factories. I know actual location of these two DC. I also know the fixed cost per year at these factories. I also know fixed cost per year at the DC. I also have production cost per unit. I also have inbound cost, outbound cost per unit. We also know the distance from factory to DC and DC to market. So all these data are given. So we have fitted this data in the optimization model <coughs> and these are the another few important parameters. Transportation cost is 0 0.001 per kilometer per unit, revenue is $15 per unit. So this was the model. I have to maximize my profit. So what is profit? Profit is nothing but the total revenue which I am generating by selling the products minus fixed cost of opening factory minus fixed cost of opening DC minus production cost at factory, minus inbound cost at DC, outbound cost, transportation cost from factory to DC, transportation cost from DC to factory. So this is my overall objective function. I need to maximize the profit. And then there are some constants. What are the constants? That my demand has to be satisfied at each of these four locations. And in the first case, we assume that there is no capacity constant, uh, which we have uh, changed it in the second model. Right now, there is no capacity constant. The aim is very large number. So we can see for both the factory as well as DCs, the capacity is unlimited, which we have assumed. And these are my flow balance constants. So whatever amount is coming to DC, the same amount should go out to the customer. So we solve this model and then First you solve it using Excel solver, but we discuss in the class that Excel solver has limitation. If there are more than 200 decision variables, or there are, I cannot solve this using Excel. So if the model becomes complex, suppose I have 4,000 4, customers, I have 100 possible location of DC, 20 possible location of factory, I cannot get the solution using Excel solver. So is there any method? So therefore use uh, any logistics. And any logistics, the advantage is it gives you the visual representation of the whole problem. So this is a possible paths. Okay, the all possible paths are shown over here. The Parimal, if you are here, so these are all possible paths. I can go from Aurangabad to Bapi, then Bapi to different customers. I can go to Nasik to Bapi, then from Bapi to different customers. I can go from Nasik to uh, Bivandi, from Bivandi different customers. I can go to Aurangabad to Vivandi, from Vivandi, various customers. So this is all possible paths are shown in any logistics. This is not the optimum solution. Now once I applied optimization, this is what the optimum solution is. Okay. So it is telling that out of two factories, I need to open Aurangabad factory. You see, 
classic factory model is suggesting don't open so wrong over factories open then out of two factory bhapi and vivandi bhapi factory is being open you can see so if you go back to the previous slide i have two factories two dcs these are possible paths but after optimization i can see i have to open factory at orangabad i have to open factory dc at bhapi so all the products will come from orangabad to bhapi then from bhapi dc products will go to surat amdavad mumbai and pune as per the demands so this is my optimum supply chain network okay. then what we did uh, then we revised the model instead of Uh, yearly demand, we put the daily demand. That is the only difference, and solve the model. Again, uh, we got the optimum solution: Orangabad to Bhapi, Bhapi to Surat, Surat to Ahmedabad, Bhapi to Mumbai, Bhapi to Pune. So there is no change in the uh, network. Only thing in the second case, we change demand from month yearly to daily because any logistic has this capability to capture daily demand also. So I am sure, very much like your. Uh, question is answered. If you have any further doubt, uh, please write it in the chat box so that we can answer. So we have. Uh... Few questions uh, related to exam. I'm just going through the others. Uh, okay, so there is one query by Piyush Bhatia on uh, blockchain. In layman terms, how it is different from existing ERP system? Uh, so, would you like to take that? Uh, would you would would you like to answer that or? Uh, We can What go is, ahead. Yeah, you can go ahead. Yes, and then you can add to that, I guess. Uh, so, Piyush, thank you for this question. Um, blockchain is actually a bit difficult to understand. I will uh, agree to that aspect for sure. Uh, and we have seen very limited use cases also of blockchain in the industry. It is not a very widespread uh, use of technology that you could expect compared to the kind of benefits it actually has. So, in very layman terms, the idea of blockchain is to give you a single source of truth with respect to transactions. Which means, let us say, for example, I am a supplier of goods to a factory. Maybe I am supplying components, and I have uh, dispatched these components. So, I will share with my, uh, you know, fact with the factory, which is my client. That I have sent across uh, so many containers of the components, or maybe so many pallets, or so many consignments have been sent. This is the information that I am sharing as a supplier. Now, who has verified this information? Nobody has verified this information other than the fact that I am declaring it at the time of dispatch. This can only be verified once it has been received at the factory. and once it is received at the factory there is a good chance that there could be some discrepancy in the number it could be an honest mistake by the supplier in declaring the wrong number or there could actually be a case of a wrong shipment being sent to wrong place some errors like this but huge amounts of time are going to go in by the time we receive the shipment and we actually check whether this discrepancy was there or not uh, also when this uh, discrepancy is being checked your supplier might not actually be there at the factory in order to check these discrepancies so this is where the idea of blockchain technology comes in and this is very strongly connected to track and trace systems because in track and trace systems uh, this helps us create that single source of truth meaning when the supplier has dispatched the items the items are scanned according to the code of the product which has been requested by the factory Uh, or the component code which is requested in the quantities, and this information will be available in real time to all the parties involved, and they will also accept that this is being dispatched. So it is not that the supplier is accepting that he is dispatching, but everyone would have accepted that this dispatch is occurring once the uh, uh, items have been loaded. Uh, so similarly, once the items have been received, everyone will be able to accept that the items have been 
receive. Now what is happening over here is all of this processing of information is happening almost in real time as a result of the fact that the information is available across all stakeholders and this is like I said single source of truth. Why do we call this a single source of truth? If an item has been dispatched, nobody will be able to change the date of entry against that transaction. Right? No one will be able to change that date of entry because that particular piece of information is going to be highly secure, which is what we call as immutable. You cannot change the very fact that that information has been created on that particular date and time. So since this information cannot be edited, it is a very secure way of actually saying that transactions have occurred. So this is a very important aspect of blockchains because it brings in a lot of security and safety into the nature of transactions that are being carried out. So as a result of this, you do not need, let us say, a third party uh, to validate. You do not need unnecessary, uh, unnecessary audits to be carried out. And you will be able to rely upon the information for faster processing of your onward processes. So it improves efficiency also. Now, if any change has to be done, right, then the only possible way is that all the parties actually accept and they have some kind of uh, secure access to doing this. But even then, they cannot change the fact that this amount has actually been dispatched or not dispatched. There is a single source of truth. So only at a later date, somebody might be able to say something. So that means it will showcase a lot of, uh, if an error has occurred, it will showcase that an error has occurred. Everything will be recorded in a timestamp fashion. So if you cannot change things in the chronology of events which have happened for a specific set of transactions, then you can trust that particular process much more. Now compare this to ERP. In ERP what happens, we are able to uh, dispatch the products and then we are going to enter this information into the ERP system using again maybe track and trace technology but we still have flexibility to edit and change information over there and at the same time one of the other challenges that happens in ERP systems is the kind of ERP system that I am using might not match with the ERP system that you are using. Sometimes there are also information uh, pieces that need to be put together and all of these challenges that occur. Now, as a result of this, the amount of security that you are having in an ERP system is a little lesser because there are a lot of parties who have access to the information and can actually make a lot of edits and changes. It is permissible and this makes ERP that way more user friendly and flexible to use. That is one of the benefits that we have uh, because a lot of manual interventions are actually permitted. But uh, what happens is it reduces the security in the supply chain, although it is still a very good piece of transaction uh, information which is occurring, but it still brings in a little bit of reduction in the security in the supply chain. So what happens is you will then not trust the transactions and unnecessarily you might get into uh, litigation issues at some point in time in the future. So this was just to give an idea as to how blockchain is actually useful, but it is not very popular because the cost of technology is a bit high. Um, and like I said, it is very secure. So the cost of security is actually what you will be paying for uh, in the blockchain. And uh, you also look at uh, the kind of uh, uh, you know provision it has. You cannot change information, right? So this might not be something that a lot of supply chain players actually want. They might want some kind of flexibility and all of that. So they might not want a blockchain also. This kind of resistance to having this technology might also be there. Uh, but it needs to be explored into, uh, you know, in a much more detailed fashion. There are some good use cases. Um, I will encourage you to look up uh, blockchain use cases by IBM. They have a very nice website and repository of the use cases where they have explained in various examples in oil and gas retail. Food, food supply chains use blockchain and uh, you'll be able to understand how blockchain is actually connected to track and trace. One of the other applications of blockchain, because it is creating transactions which are a single source of truth, as a result of this, you can automate maybe other transactions also. So what we mean by automation is, uh, let us say we are talking about uh, uh, payment to your vendor. This can actually be automated because the blockchain has given you the actual information of whether the 
items dispatched and the items received are going to be the same. It already knows in advance. So the only thing which is required is scanning the product at dispatch, scanning the product at receipt. Once the scanning is done, then immediately you don't need to do a lot of paperwork and immediately the payments can be released to the uh, vendor without the need for too much manual intervention. So again, this is since it is so secure, you can uh, trust the blockchain much more in order to uh, handle the uh, commercial transactions as well. So this is the application. Now automation is also a part of ERP. In ERP also we have a lot of automation processes that are carried out, but we do not extend it uh, uh, without, uh, you know, let us say you do need at every stage in an ERP system an approval process which needs to be present. So there will be a lot of authorities who will approve every step of the workflow before it can actually be released. So although some of the steps are automated, you will still have some manual intervention at some key stages within the ERP also. So this is broadly the difference I am sharing between blockchain and ERP and the application potential of blockchain. Uh, I hope uh, this is uh, useful to you. Uh, Professor Devaruta, you can add to it if anything. So very nicely explained, uh, Sushmita. This was very thorough, actually. <laughs> I'm sure participants have got the difference. So nothing more to add from my side. You can get a lot of uh, practical examples nowadays. If you see the Gartner report, MacKenzie report, they have explained very nicely, like how blockchains are being used for quality assurance, and, and tracing and tracking of products and raw materials. Yeah, so very nicely explained by uh, Professor. So anything else uh, to add? Like I can see one comment by Sangam Mr. Yeah, so you are right. Uh, actually, like I don't need to check every day, but this was just to give an idea about the participants. Now, how overall I gave an idea, but I don't need to check like lakhs of inventory every day. Uh, you have to only check whatever transactions you are doing. But unless there are some pilfages happen, there are sometimes uh, you keep the products while picking or keeping the items in the, uh, let us say, cell. Instead of keeping in cell pay, you may keep in cell B. There are a lot of ways uh, the misplacement of inventory may happen. The return also may come in, and in place of putting the return in the right cell, you may put the return along with the new stock. So although inventory count is 100, but actually it may show 101 also. So therefore, there are various issues uh, because of that, like people still refer to a physical account, but it may not be daily. They do zone-wise, they cluster from which zone uh, most of the discrepancies are happening. Many times uh, you will find there are some specific employees, specific zone, where a lot of discrepancies are happening. So I do sampling and then find out these are the location I need to have a look at it in detail. So I wanted to give you a broad idea like how digitization is helping. Uh, but you are right, your points are very well taken. I am sure participants have also noted that. Thank you. So we have one comment from Mr. Mukesh Singh. In this program, the role of financial institution should be added with few example. It helps in raw material procurement. And it is a very good feedback that you have shared, uh, Mukesh. And uh, I think that's a good uh, uh, idea, actually. Uh, with the growing role of um, technology, especially your uh, fintech uh, technologies, uh, it is becoming very inevitable that supply chain management can be taught without exploring fintech. Uh, we have covered a bit of uh, the financial implications of operations in some of the beginning sessions of the program. Um, but however, like you mentioned, uh, we have also covered a few topics related to fintech and blockchain towards the end of the program. So I would encourage you to go through the sessions um, and if anything uh, specific comes to mind, uh, you can also explore it or let us know uh, in, the, you know uh, in the discussion forum as well. And, uh, but it's a very useful point that you have shared for sure with the growth of e-commerce, the role of uh, fintech cannot be neglected. Uh, and uh, in, it is interesting because even the nature of financial institutions is also changing. It is not only supply chains which are changing, but the nature of financial institutions, the kind of products that they are dealing with, let's say we are talking about cryptocurrencies these days. 
Now, how can I use cryptocurrency in a supply chain becomes a very interesting topic to actually explore. So these will all become the next generation applications that we are speaking about. Uh, and we also have uh, different kinds of uh, capabilities that are required as a result. Uh, there is a huge domain in itself which is called a supply chain finance. Uh, it is also one of the reasons why we have not included this in uh, our course. Supply chain finance is a topic which connects supply chain management with accounting and finance principles. Uh, mainly when we speak about cash flows, when we speak about working capital, asset management, all of these are supply chain decisions, uh, but they are mostly understood nowadays uh, only from the level of one organization. What is very much needed is the implication of operations on the financial performance of several organizations within a supply chain. Because what we do might be financially beneficial to us. Let us say I am a company like Amazon. What Amazon does may be beneficial to Amazon from a profitability perspective but it not be beneficial to the small vendors who are working with Amazon. Or similarly, I may be an automotive manufacturer, OEM, okay, original equipment manufacturer. I might be taking steps uh, in terms of the products I create, in terms of the volumes that I have, which are financially profitable for me as an OEM. But what I am taking as a decision might not be very uh, helpful or it might actually be harmful to the component supply. So you might be procuring things at a very cheap price and you might not be paying back your suppliers at the right time. Uh, as a result of this, you are enjoying the financial benefits of doing that. But at the same time what happens, your component supplier starts suffering. And once he starts suffering, what was actually your financial benefit in the short term might deteriorate to a very big disadvantage in the long term because your supplier might not be able to sustain in the long term. And as a result, your supply chain actually completely gets disrupted. So this is where the role of supply chain finance is very important. And this is where we have, like you have mentioned, financial institutions which actually enter into this process, which can help in providing vendor financing solutions that can help your vendors develop. Uh, at the same time, it will also help the uh, clients to be financially profitable. So everybody has a reason to function in this particular supply chain. And at, as a result of this, your supply chain will last longer also. So this is a very interesting area. I would definitely um, encourage you to further explore. And thank you for bringing that point up. Uh, I hope there were some points that I mentioned that will be useful for the participants to explore further. Uh, and I will encourage in that direction itself. Thank you, Mokesh. <coughs> there was one question in the uh, response sheet by Krishna Kantposna. Please provide more software name which is useful in WMS or TMS. So, can you please shed some more light on that? Uh, just a second. Let me just open up that query. Okay, so there are actually a lot of companies that are working in this domain and uh, you know I don't want to use this NPTEL course as a brand uh, placement opportunity but there are a few companies like Blue Yonder who are doing good work in WMS and TMS solutions. Um, and uh, there are a couple of other tech firms which are there in this. There are in fact a lot of startups which are creating WMS solutions and TMS solutions uh, and I would encourage you to do that, uh, to go through. I am sure we will be having uh, industry reports which will also help in you know providing you the uh, types of companies that can be uh, you know the market uh, leaders in this specific segment. 
but yes i mean i would not want to take this opportunity to list out names of several companies in the tech uh, solution space uh, but one of them i can definitely talk about is blue yonder i would encourage you to look at that uh, we also have companies like logi next that provide route optimization and um, you know several other big firms mncs which are there in this uh, domain let me see if any other uh, queries Yeah, there's a very specific technical query asked by Saurabh. I think that will be best responded um, over a discussion forum on uh, calculating the inventory turnover rate of Airbus. Um, you know, this is given by Saurabh. Uh, it is talking about average inventory value at the beginning and end of the year and the cost of goods sold. Uh, yes, you can calculate the inventory turnover rate uh, using this information. Uh, I think this can be answered using the discussion forum, I guess, because it's a it relates to calculation. So I am sure that calculation can be done and the answer can be shared with. You. Uh, so yes, I think we have no further questions. Um, I hope we have responded to all the queries of the participants. I believe this is the last live session. Yes, yes. I think most of the queries have been. And sir, yes, and this is the last session because their exams are starting, I think, on 26th or 27th. Uh, so, NPTEL team will confirm. So, all the best. <laughs> Thank you, everyone. Wish you all the best for the exams. And it was very nice uh, participating as uh, you know training faculty within this uh, program. And we hope to meet you in future. Either uh, you know you can visit us at IIM Mumbai, or uh, we can uh, meet in some other courses online or offline. Uh, so we look forward to the engagement. It has been a pleasure discussing with all of you. Thank you so much, and wish you all the best. Yeah, thank you. Thank thanks all the participants. Wish you all the best. Okay. I think we can close now. Yes. Okay, sir. We'll close the session. Yes, sir. Thank you, Devendra Ji. Thank you, Devendra.